Hey. Okay, we're here now. So let's resume our study of Book 2, Chapter 3 of 1984. We can come here once again, said Julia. It's generally safe to use any hideout twice, but not for another month or two, of course. As soon as she woke up, her demeanor had changed. She became alert and businesslike, put her clothes on, knotted the scarlet sash about her waist, and began arranging the details of the journey home. It seemed natural to leave this to her. She obviously had a practical cunning which Winston lacked, and she seemed also to have an exhaustive knowledge of the countryside around London, stored away from innumerable community hikes. The route she gave him was quite different from the one by which he had come, and brought him about at a different railway station. Never go home the same way as you went out, she said, as though enunciating an important general principle. She would leave first, and Winston was to wait half an hour before following her. She had named a place where they could meet after work four evenings hence. It was a street in one of the poorer quarters where there was an open market which was generally crowded and noisy. She would be hanging about among the stalls, pretending to be in search of shoelaces or sewing thread. If she judged that the coast was clear, she would blow her nose when he approached, otherwise he was to walk ten past her without recognition. But with luck, in the middle of the crowd, it would be safe to talk for a quarter of an hour and arrange another meeting. And now I must go, she said, as soon as he had mastered his instructions. I'm due back at 19.30. I've got to put in two hours for the junior sex league, handing out leaflets or something. Isn't it bloody? Give me a brush down, wouldn't you? Have I got any twigs in my hair? Are you sure? Then, goodbye, my love. Goodbye. She flung herself into his arms and kissed him violently, and a moment later pushed her way through the saplings and disappeared into the wood with very little noise. Even now he had not found out her surname or her address. However, it made no difference, for it was inconceivable that they could ever meet indoors or exchange any kind of written communication. As it happened, they never went back to the clearing in the wood. During the month of May, there was only one further occasion on which they actually succeeded in making love. That was in another hiding place known to Julia, the belfry of Erroneous Church, in an almost deserted stretch of a country where an atomic bomb had fallen thirty years earlier. It was a good hiding place where once you got there, but the getting there was very dangerous. For the rest, they could only meet in the streets, in a different place every evening, and never for more than half an hour at a time. In the street it was usually possible to talk, after a fashion, and they drifted down the crowded pavements, not quite abreast, and never looking at one another. They had carried on a curious, intermittent conversation which flicked on and off like the beams of a lighthouse suddenly nipped into silence by the approach of a party uniform, or the proximity of a telescreen. Then, 
taken up again minutes later in the middle of a sentence, then abruptly cut short as they parted at the agreed spot, then continued almost without introduction on the following day. Julia appeared to be quite used to this kind of conversation, which she called talking by installments. She was also surprisingly adept at speaking without moving her lips. Just once in almost a month of nightly meetings, they managed to exchange a kiss. They were passing in silence down a side street. Julia would never speak when they were away from main streets. When there was a deafening roar, the earth heaved and the air darkened, and Winston found himself lying on his side, bruised and terrified. A rocket bomb must have dropped quite near at hand. Suddenly, he became aware of Julia's face a few centimetres from his own, deathly white, as white as chalk. Even her lips were white. She was dead. He clasped her against him, and found he was kissing a live, warm face. But there was some powdery stuff that got in the way of his lips. Both of their faces were thickly coated in plaster. There were evenings where they reached their rendezvous, and then had to walk past one another without a sign, because a patrol had just come round the corner, or a helicopter was hovering overhead. Even if it had been less dangerous, it would still have been difficult to find time to meet. Winston's working week was sixty hours. Julia's was even longer, and their free days varied according to the pressure of work did not seem often coincide. Julia, in any case, seldom had an evening completely free. She spent an astonishing amount of time in attending lectures and demonstrations, distributing literature for the Junior Anti-Sex League, preparing banners for Hate Week making collections for the savings campaigns, and such like activities. It paid, she said, it was camouflage. If you kept the small rules, you could break the big ones. She even induced Winston to mortgage yet another of his evenings by enrolling himself for the party-time munition work which was done voluntarily by zealous party members. So, one evening a week, Winston spent four hours of paralyzing boredom screwing together small bits of metal, which were probably parts of bomb fuses, in a draughty, ill-lit workshop, where the knocking of hammers mingled drearily with the music of telescreens. When they met in the church tower, the gaps in their fragmentary conversation were filled up. It was a blazing afternoon. The air in the little square chamber above the bells was hot and stagnant, and smelt overpoweringly of pigeon dung. They sat talking for hours on the dusty, twig-littered floor one or another of them getting up from time to time to cast a glance through the arrow slits and make sure that no one was coming. Julia was twenty-six years old. She lived in a hostel with thirty other girls, always in the stink of women. How I hate women, she said parenthetically, and she worked as he had guessed, on the novel writing machines in the fiction department. She enjoyed her work, which consisted chiefly in running and servicing a powerful but 
tricky electric motor. She was not clever, but was fond of using her hands and felt at home with machinery. She could describe the whole process of composing a novel, from the general directive issued by the planning committee down to the final touching up by the rewrite squad. But she was not interested in the finished product. She didn't much care for reading, she said. Books were just a commodity that had to be produced, like jam or boot laces. She had no memories of anything before the early 60s, and the only person she had ever known who talked frequently of the days before the revolution was a grandfather who had disappeared when she was eight. At school, she had been captain of the hockey team, and had won the gymnastics trophy two years running. She had been a troop leader in the spies, and a branch secretary in the youth league before joining the junior anti-sex league. She had always borne an excellent character. She had even an infallible mark of good reputation, been picked out to work in Pornosec, the subsection of the fiction department which turned out cheap pornography for distribution among the proles. It was nicknamed Muck House by the people who worked in it, she remarked. There she had remained for a year, helping to produce booklets in sealed packets with titles like Spanking Stories or One Night in a Girl's School, to be bought furtively by proletarian youths who were under the impression that they were buying something illegal. What were these books like? said Winston curiously. Oh, ghastly rubbish. They're boring, really. They only have six plots, but they swap them round a bit. Of course, I was only on the kaleidoscopes. I was never in the rewrite squad. I'm not literary, dear. Not even enough for that. He learned with astonishment that all the workers in Pornosec, even the heads of the departments, were girls. The theory was that men whose sex instincts were less controllable than those of women were in greater danger of being corrupted by the filth that they handled. They don't even like having married women in there, she added. Girls are always supposed to be so pure. Here's one who isn't, anyway. She had her first love affair when she was sixteen with a party member of sixty, who later committed suicide to avoid arrest. Otherwise, they'd have my name out of him when he confessed. Since then... There had been various others. Life as she saw it was quite simple. You wanted a good time. They, meaning the party, wanted to stop you having it. You broke the rules as best as you could. She seemed to think it just as natural that they should want to rob you of your pleasures as that you should want to avoid being caught. She hated the party, and said so in the crudest words, but she made no general criticism of it, except where it touched upon her own life. She had no interest in party doctrine. He noticed that she never used newspeak words except the ones that had passed into everyday use. She had never heard of the Brotherhood, and refused to believe in its existence. Any kind of organised revolt against the party, which was bound to be a failure, struck her as stupid. The clever thing was to break the rules and stay alive all the same. 
He wondered vaguely how many others like her there might be in the younger generation people who had grown up in the world of the revolution. Knowing nothing else, accepting the party as something unalterable, like the sky, not rebelling against its authority, but simply evading it, as a rabbit dodges a dog. They did not discuss the possibility of getting married. It was too remote to be worth thinking about. No imaginable committee would ever sanction such a marriage, even if Catherine, Winston's wife, could somehow have been got rid of. It was hopeless even as a daydream. What was she like, your wife? said Julia. She was. Do you know the new speak word good thinkful? Meaning naturally orthodox, incapable of thinking a bad thought. No, I didn't know that word, but I know the kind of person right enough. He began telling her the story of his married life, but curiously enough, she appeared to know the essential parts of it already. She described him almost as though she had seen or felt it, the stiffening of Catherine's body as soon as he touched her. The way in which she still seemed to be pushing him from her with all her strength, even when her arms were clasped tightly round him. With Julia, he felt no difficulty in talking about such things. Catherine, in any case, had long ceased to be a painful memory, and became merely a distasteful one. I could have stood it if it hadn't been for one thing, he said. He told her about the frigid little ceremony that Catherine had forced him to go through on the same night every week. She hated it, but nothing would make her stop doing it. She used to call it, oh, but you'll never guess, our duty to the party, said Julia promptly. How did you know that? I've been at school too, dear. Sex talks once a month for the over-sixteens, and in the youth movement, they rub it into you for years. I dare say it works in a lot of cases, but of course you can never tell. People are such hypocrites. She began to enlarge upon the subject. With Julia, everything came back to her own sexuality. As soon as this was touched upon in any way, she was capable of great acuteness. Unlike Winston, she had grasped the inner meaning of the party's sexual puritanism. It was not merely that the sex instinct created a world of its own which was outside the party's control, and which therefore had to be destroyed if possible. What was more important was that sexual privation induced hysteria, which was desirable because it could be transformed into war fever and leader worship. The way she put it was, when you make love you're using up energy and afterwards you feel happy and don't give a damn for anything. They can't bear you to feel like that. They want you to be bursting with energy all the time. All this marching up and down and cheering and waving flags is simply sex gone sour. If you're happy inside yourself, why should you get excited about Big Brother? And the three year plans and the two minutes hate and all the rest of their bloody rot. This was very true, he thought. There was a direct, intimate connection between chastity and political orthodoxy. For how could the fear, the hatred, and the lunatic credulity which the party needed in its members be kept at the right pitch, except by bottling down some powerful instinct 
and using it as a driving force. The sex impulse was dangerous to the party, and the party had turned it to account. They had played a similar trick with the instinct of parenthood. The family could not actually be abolished, and indeed, people were encouraged to be fond of their children, in almost the old-fashioned way. The children, on the other hand, were systematically turned against their parents and taught to spy on them and report their deviations. The family had become, in effect, an extension of the thought police. It was a device by means of which everyone could be surrounded night and day by informers who knew him intimately. Abruptly, his mind went back to Catherine. Catherine would unquestionably have denounced him to the thought police if she had not happened to be too stupid to detect the unorthodoxy of his opinions. But what really recalled her to him at this moment was the stifling heat of the afternoon, which had brought the sweat out on his forehead. He began telling Julia of something that had happened, or rather had failed to happen on another sweltering summer afternoon eleven years ago. It was three or four months after they were married. They had lost their way on the community hike somewhere in Kent. They had only lagged behind the others for a couple of minutes, but they took a wrong turn and presently found themselves pulled up short by the edge of an old chalk quarry. It was a sheer drop of ten or twenty metres, with eighteen boulders at the bottom. There was nobody of whom they could ask the way, and as soon as she realised that they were lost, Catherine became very uneasy. To be far away from the noisy mob of hikers, even for a moment, gave her a feeling of wrongdoing. She wanted to hurry back the way she had come and start searching in the other direction. But at this moment, Winston noticed some tufts of loose strife growing in the cracks of the cliff beneath them. One tuft of two colours, magenta and brick red, apparently growing on the same route. He had never seen anything of that kind before, and he called Catherine to come look at it. <laughs> look, Catherine, look at those flowers, that clump down there near the bottom. Do you see they're two different colours? She had already turned to go, but she did rather fretfully come back for a moment. She had leaned out over the cliff face to see where he was pointing. He was standing a little behind her, and he put his hand on her waist to steady her. At this moment it suddenly occurred to him how completely alone they were. There was not a human creature anywhere, not a leaf stirring, not even a bird awake in a place like this. The danger that there would be a hidden microphone was very small, and even if there was a microphone, it would only pick up sounds. It was the hottest, sleepiest hour of the afternoon. The sun blazed down upon them. The sweat tickled his face, and the thought struck him. Why didn't you give her a good shove? said Julia, I would have. Yes, dear, you would have. I would, if I had been the same person then as I am now. Or perhaps I would. I'm not certain. Are you sure you didn't? Yes, on the whole, I'm sorry I didn't. They were sitting side by side on the dusty floor. He pulled her closer against him. Her head rested on his shoulder pleasant smell of her hair, conquering the pigeon dun. The pleasant smell of her hair, conquering the pigeon dun. She was very young, he thought. She still expected something from life. 
she did not understand that to push an inconvenient person over a cliff solves nothing. Actually, it would have made no difference, he said. Then why are you sorry you didn't do it? Only because I prefer a positive to a negative. In this game that we're playing, we can't win. Some kinds of failure are better than other kinds, that's all. He felt her shoulders give a wriggle of dissent. She always contradicted him when he said anything of this kind. She would not accept it as a law of nature that the individual is always defeated. In a way, she realised that she herself was doomed. Sooner or later, the thought police would catch her and kill her. But with another part of her mind, she believed it was somehow possible to construct a secret world in which you could live as you chose. All you needed was luck and cunning and boldness. She did not understand that there was no such thing as happiness, that the only victory lay in the far future long after you were dead. That from the moment of declaring war on the party, it was better to think of yourself as a corpse. We are the dead, he said. We're not dead yet, said Julia prosaically. Not physically, in six months, a year, five years, conceivably. I am afraid of death. You were young, so presumably you're more afraid of it than I am. Obviously, we shall put it off as long as we can, but it makes very little difference. So long as human beings stay human, death and life are the same thing. Oh, rubbish. Which would you sooner sleep with me or a skeleton? Don't you enjoy being alive? Don't you like feeling? This is me. This is my hand. This is my leg. I'm real. I'm solid. I'm alive. Don't you like this? She twisted herself round and pressed her bosom against him. He could feel her breast, ripe yet firm, through overalls. Her body seemed to be pouring some of its youth and vigour into his. Yes, I like that, he said. Then stop talking about dying. Now listen, dear, we've got to fix up about the next time we meet. We may as well go back to the place in the woods. We've given it a good long rest, but you must get there by a different way this time. I've got it all planned out. You take the train. But look, I'll draw it up for you. And in her practical way, she scraped together a small square of dust, and with a twig from the pigeon's nest, began drawing a map on the floor. That's the end of chapter three. We should probably get a move on, and then let's go study chapter four. Okay, let's go.